today we're talking about open energy system modeling in Africa. Um, what is the state of art and, and what kind of future opportunities are there? Um, myself, I'm a founder and uh, like project leader of this um, Pipes and Meets Africa project, which we are also introducing later. Um, I'm doing also a PhD at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, just a disclaimer, like all this kind of event wouldn't be possible without a great team. So I, I have many people supporting this event. Um, and, and also uh, IEEE um, PASS ambassadors uh, who um, co-organized this event. So I'm really happy um, that we could make it happen. Going on with the purpose of this meeting is like we discuss about open energy system modeling, um, how they differ from closed models, um, what is the state of art and, and the future opportunities. Um, and then we are introducing this new model. Um, so yeah, like this event would be also nothing without uh, the right uh, panelists. Um, and I'm glad to introduce uh, now um, Tom. Um, he's director of uh, power generation and operational uh, operation and maintenance at the Rwanda Energy Group. So, Tom, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Tom Nguahama. I work with the Rwanda Energy Group uh, in charge of power generation, operations and maintenance. But uh, prior to my current uh, job, I was um, working with the ministry and I was in charge of uh, regional projects, but also um, sector uh, financing, energy sector financing. And uh, prior to that, I was here at the utility as a power system planning engineer. So that's briefly uh, what I've been working on uh, over the past years of my experience. And I'm glad to meet a, a group of uh, different experts in, in different areas um, who are eager to you know, plan for, for, uh, for our future in terms of energy needs. And uh, it's my pleasure. I look forward to having a, a fruitful discussion with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Let's move on to Aminu. Um, um, Aminu is an analyst with, 10 years, uh, with more than 10 years of experience. Um, he's working at the Department of Energy and Policy and the Nigerian Energy Commission. Um, Aminu? Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Max Miller. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Aminu Haru Naisa. I've been working with the Energy Commission of Nigeria as an energy analyst, and I'm particularly in the Department of Energy Planning and Analysis. So I am solidly working on energy demand for the country. I'm working on energy entirely, when it means both uh, electricity and any other forms of energy. So we do demand for uh, the country. And then for the past 10 years, we are working on modeling the energy sector. So we determine the demand and then the supply options. And also uh, currently we are working with uh, the UK base uh, tool that is uh, 2050 calculator that gives us the best options for uh, emission reductions in the energy utilization of Nigeria. Uh, so as we go along, I will talk more on it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aminu. Um, okay, then let's uh, move on to the pyramids. Uh, Khalid. Yes. Please. Um, so um, Khalid is a strategic planning expert at the Egyptian Electricity Holding Company, and uh, which is uh, like they're working basically in collaboration with the Ministry of Electricity and Renewable Energy. Um, Khalid, please, can you introduce a bit uh, what you're doing? And yes. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm so happy that to, to meet uh, many experts from uh, um, uh, different places in, in our world. So. Uh, uh, I'm very interested to, uh, to discuss with you about the energy modeling and the open source issue. Uh, I'm Khalid Salem. I'm an electrical engineer. I have uh, 17 years old of experience in different area of uh, electricity utilities. I had eight years in Gulf regions uh, in Saudi Arabia. I was an electricity utility there. Uh, my main uh, field of work is strategic planning. I am using uh, different uh, uh, programs and tools to develop the 
the strategic uh, or, or the expansion of generation and transmission in, in Egypt. Um, uh, I feel that uh, today we will have uh, a very good opportunity to exchange the knowledge of this uh, about the, the planning issue. And uh, okay, thank you for everyone, and thank you, Max, to, uh, for this invitation. And uh, I feel the privilege to participate in such this event. Thank you very much, Kelly, for the okay. kind words. Um, then, um, as a next panelist, we have also Jared uh, Wright here, uh, who is a principal researcher at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research um, (CSIR) in South Africa. Jared, um, how are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, good. Thank you for the opportunity. So yeah, Jared Wright from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa. I'm a principal researcher there. We're um, within one of the areas of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research called the Energy Center. I'm particularly focusing on energy systems, um, how all of it fits together, and more specifically in um, energy planning, uh, long-term energy planning. Uh, looking at a range of decarbonization scenarios for South Africa, not just necessarily in the power sector, of course, the power sector being the lowest hanging fruit initially, but then more the full sector energy perspective, electrification of particular end use, and uh, therefore the ability to then decarbonize further uh, as a country that's coming from a large predominantly coal base. Um, my background is uh, I'm an electrical engineer, um, uh, studied in South Africa and have come from a private sector consulting background and then into what is now the a nationally um, state-owned research institution called the CSIR. Thanks. Thank you, Jared. Um, and like finally, we have Stefan Penninger uh, here uh, joining. He, he wrote a couple of uh, amazing uh, articles, uh, nature articles as well, um, on, on the area of open science, uh, transparent uh, tools. And uh, Stefan, um, please, um, can you introduce yourself? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Stefan Fenninger. I recently joined TU Delft in the Netherlands as assistant professor of energy systems modeling. And, and that's what I do, energy system modeling. Um, and uh, particularly um, energy systems modeling of systems with high shares of renewables. So wind and solar power and their role in the energy transition. And I guess, like, we can actually, that's a perfect moment to, to move on. Um, like, you will enlighten us a bit, okay, uh, what is, like, uh, open modeling, what's closed modeling, like, what kind of differences are there um, to bring us on the same base? Um, so, Stefan, um, I think it's, it's, it's your, your stage now, please. Okay, thanks a lot. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so yeah, um, I've, I've been given <laughs> 10 minutes to explain what energy system modeling is, what open energy system modeling is and why open energy system modeling matters. So there's no time to lose and let's jump right in. So what is an energy system model? Well, you'll get answers like it's, it's a model of all the processes that convert primary energy into final energy services, the different technologies, the transformation pathways that, through which all of this happens, for example, at the scale of, say, uh, a country or, or a whole continent. And indeed, energy system models represent technologies and how they fit together to deliver, say, an energy demand. And depending on the spatial resolution, of the model, maybe also how this energy moves around, so to speak, for example, on the power grid. Now, some aspects of this model you could actually validate. Say you might have time series of wind power generation based on weather data, but things soon get quite tricky. You might have time series of energy demand, and that of course contains human behavior. So you're also modeling humans, maybe indirectly. And finally, you usually optimize for something like you want to minimize costs. So you also have lots of costs in your model for different technologies. This is even more tricky. What is the true cost of a technology of, of a nuclear power station, for example? So 
what is an energy system model? Well, it's, it's a representation of an engineered system that contains lots of built-in built in assumptions about things like behavior, markets, et cetera. So it's very much, very much not um, a model of a natural process, like here, uh, the Copernicus model of how the solar system works, where we can measure and examine, actually determine how well our model actually depicts this natural process. This is not uh, an energy system model. Energy system models are a completely different beast, and it's important to keep that in mind. So on the one hand, there are what we could call operational models. So market models used by say a trading firm or grid models used by network operators to run their business. And these sometimes use the same methods or the same tools as energy system models. But what I primarily want to talk about now is what we might call decision support models, which are mostly explorative, what, what can happen or normative, what should happen. And people sometimes say things like, well, this or that energy system model has completely wrongly predicted the cost of say photovoltaics. But that's actually not quite right because these models cannot predict anything. Cost in this case is simply an assumption that is put into the model by the modeler. So you can't predict the future with an energy system model, but what can you do? Well, for example, you can quantify trade-offs between different choices and thus help make a decision. In this example, the trade-offs between having a continent-wide optimized renewable electricity system or a system where renewable capacity is distributed equally across the regions. And then your energy system model can quantify what this implies for cost, for generation requirements, for transmission, and so on. So the model can't really tell you what to do, but it can help us systematically explore different options using quantitative metrics. So, we said that energy system models are very much not models of natural processes. Instead, I would say they are thought experiments and they're thought experiments driven by their assumptions. And this is quite important because they don't deliver a kind of truth. There are lots of assumptions inside these models. And these assumptions reflect social and scientific discourses. Modelers like myself, we have opinions, we have preferences, possibly even feelings. And these things filter through into the model assumptions. So a very simple example, the choice of technology to include in a model. If I think, well, nuclear power really isn't very great or you know, carbon capture and storage CCS is nonsense, then I won't include that technology in my model. And that of course will dramatically affect the thought experiment that I'm performing. And it will dramatically affect the results. For example, the results in terms of this, this trade-off in continental versus regional scale supply. So let's look at the modeling process. In theory, I start with a question or a problem, like this question of trade-offs between continental and regional scale supply. I sit down, I think through what I need to answer this question, and I make some assumptions. I gather and process input data, I use these assumptions and data together with a tool uh, to formulate a model. I run this model, I generate some results, and then I analyze and interpret the results. And probably I publish this interpretation as a report or as a paper or something like that. So far, so good. Now, the problem is that after I've done this, I have a model, my model, um, and now you might see where I'm going with this. I spend a lot of time building this model and I now see it as a kind of tool that I have at hand, you know, a hammer that I'm holding and I suddenly start seeing nails everywhere that I can use my hammer on. So once I have this model, I might start to look for other questions or problems to apply my model to. Now you can see that the process has changed slightly. This is quite dangerous potentially because I'm no longer starting with the question. 
my initial assumptions that I made have started to fade into the background and they're now inside this black box that, that I've called my model here. Now the question is, are these assumptions actually still valid? Is this model that I actually have really able to answer the new question that I'm trying to use it on? Now, this is where openness comes in. If we look again at the modeling process, this, this modeling process as it should be in theory, and, and let's look at what openness means in this process. And there are different types of openness. At the core of my model is the formulation, the software choice. And here we have computer code in some programming language. Ideally, this should be open source code so that others can inspect what this code actually does. This code might extend a little bit into the data and the results part because I'm also using code to process my input and output data. Now, next comes the data. The data is a whole other beast. It's often the trickiest part because I might have used, for example, commercially sensitive data that I cannot release publicly, but ideally as much as possible, the data, the assumptions should also be openly available under a license that allows other people to use it. Now, finally, there is the question that I start with and the interpretation of results. Probably this is words and figures, my report or my paper. And that's where open access comes in. The idea that papers and reports describing all of this should be freely available. Now, if we think again about this idea of my model, which encapsulates the assumptions, the data, and the software choice, you can see that this actually cuts across both the open data and the open source code areas. If we go even further and consider that, as we discussed just before, my choice of assumptions, data, model formulation, et cetera, really depend on my initial question, my initial problem, then actually, this is essentially also part of my model. So documenting that question um, is, is part of the model. And we're now really cutting across all these uh, three kinds of openness. Now, why is that important? Well, in one word, understandability. Let's say we have this model consisting of the question, the assumptions, data, and the formulation. This, this model, this thought experiment, generates results. And those results are taken up in the policy and the planning process. Maybe they influence what kind of technology gets financial support or just influence what direction a policy debate goes towards. Now, the crucial bit is that these policy and societal debates then also flow back into modeling. They influence what kind of questions I as a modeler look at, what kind of assumptions I make. So, there's a sort of cycle going on here. And these models are really at the boundary of science and policy. And people usually talk about transparency here. Transparency is important. I think understandability is, is a better word. The ability to understand what's going on inside of this model box that is influencing and being influenced by um, policy and planning processes. So, this is important for the people who might use these results to guide their decisions. But it's also important for other modelers who might want to reuse this model or parts of it to answer a different question. So this ability to understand this, this understandability rests on three pillars, open code, open data, and open access. Okay, now there are also other benefits to openness. Even if you're primarily interested in say, these what I called operational models, like you're running a market model in your company, you have no intention of making it its assumptions or its results public. You still benefit from openness. You can reuse code and data, you reduce efforts, there's help from third parties in finding and fixing errors in code and data and so on. And not the least of these extra benefits is simply the diversity of openly available tools and data sets that you can build on. Uh, oh, I've Looks like there's supposed to be a bunch of data sets here in this blue box. Just imagine there are some examples there. So you can select a tool, um, 
You can select data based on the problem you're trying to address, knowing that you can examine, fix, expand, share, um, knowing that you can benefit from what the community is doing while also giving back something to the community. Okay, and that's really it. A sort of very brief overview. Here's a summary. Um, and you also have my email address there if you have any questions or want to get in touch later. So for now, thanks a lot. And looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, uh, Stefan. A really fantastic presentation. Um, yeah, like I think um, we have now roughly 20 minutes uh, to discuss in the panel um, before we moving on to the uh, next presentation. I just want to um, tell the um, uh, audience that you have at the end uh, five minutes uh, also for some questions. Uh, so um, prepare yourself, uh, like record them and um, uh, write them later, share them later with us. Um, yeah, like basically let's start a bit about, okay, um, what is the um, state of the art? Um, so um, I, I think Khalid, uh, you mentioned um, that you're using in Egypt um, kind of closed and open source models. Um, what are the reasons uh, for using them? Like why are you using both? Um, why not just open models? Because I think Stefan pointed out, yeah, there are some great benefits of it. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the nice presentation. Um, I'm talking about that the, the opportunity that we have in our company or, it, or ministry is that we have most of uh, developed the model by uh, international organizations. So for example, if it's, it's free, uh, so the, uh, inter the international organization give us the, the, this model for free and we can use it. This is uh, from, I think, 20 years ago. Nowadays, we, we, some uh, companies or some commercial companies offered us uh, more developed, more advanced model for uh, for uh, system modeling like uh, Piluxes, like uh, PSR. We have the comparison between uh, because the, our purpose uh, was to uh, integrate the generation decisions with transmission decisions. This is the the main uh, target for our company uh, nowadays. So we just focus on uh, the models or deals with the generation and transmission the couple decision uh, in, in, in the expansion plan or reinforcement the, the, the electricity network. Uh, so we didn't uh, use any open source uh, models. All what offered was closed uh, uh, source uh, models. Uh, recently, uh, Denmark, uh, government of Denmark, uh, offered us the Balmoral model. Uh, we hear that it, uh, it's it's open source model. Uh, they gave us like um, free budget, uh, like enforcement for our government to uh, to just develop the uh, the strategic planning model. Uh, sorry, plans uh, with Balmoral, but we didn't. Uh, Till now, we didn't uh, train on it. We didn't use it, uh, but we hear that it's open source. So this is what uh, I have on this issue. Thank so you. basically, um, Kelly, like what you're saying is, um, um, this commercial tools, uh, closed tools, they're having some kind of features um, which are um, not available, or you can't see them all in, in the open tools. Uh, yes, it's closed. This is a closed system. The, the developer only who who can uh, customize the model for our purpose, but we can't. We can't open the source. We we can't uh, uh, do any change for this model. Tom, um, like uh, moving to you, like uh, you said, um, there are also some kind of um, limitations of um, developing models. Um, the last time we spoke, um, I, I think. Um, yeah, like you said something okay they are like um too, like too many models uh, maybe that's also not uh, the way to move forward so uh what i was saying is that um for commercial operations uh, like you said we most of the times use customized softwares uh, as i told you uh, when we're doing like for example system planning we we use software that will help us to do continuous analysis dynamic modeling 
at times to you know, short circuit analysis to determine you know the impact of, of your sudden loading on the line and all that stuff. And um, not so many open source you can find that would be able to handle the entire system. You know, the robustness of, of, of data also determines the kind of, uh, you know, the software you can use. So we haven't been exposed to open source that much, apart from in some aspects, for example, solar energy, where we use HOMA. I'm not even sure whether it's free of charge, but I, when I was a student, I used to download it. And I also used it some time back uh, at my workplace. But um, basically, uh, like, like uh, the presenter said, if you're dealing with the decision support, uh, you know, software, or, or maybe kind of like assignment, it is possible for you to use these open source mod models. But, but, but on the side of, of, of the countries, especially like in our, in our, ex in our example, because most of these decisions are going to be taken and implemented. They want reliability. They want you to be very sure. So that's why I tend to believe that um, open source, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you cannot be sure that you will exhaust all the, all, all the, all the requirements in terms of assumptions, in, in terms of, uh, you know, scenarios and all that stuff. Although uh, I believe still that um, if people are exposed and they know exactly how much this open source uh, can, you know, software available can can be explored and, and help us. I'm sure that um, uh, it can even a starting point can it be a starting point for our planners because most of the time when we employ these commercial software, we tend to bring experts from from abroad or other countries, and, and therefore if we have these open source, they can learn from them. They can you know do basic you know planning and and somehow have some um, informed uh, you know advice or maybe decisions to to, to be taken thank you yeah. um like i like, like you mentioned here also something about um um like um, workforce which is ready to use these models right uh, maybe going beyond um just a um, normal interaction with the interface um like i think that was also something point uh, uh, Jared uh, mentioned. Um, like, is there a, is there a need for um, a more skill set, like more skilled people um, in this uh, power system modeling area? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you need um, you know software and, and modeling is no different from you know I, I, IT sector because mm. every other day. There are new applications, there are new, you know, changes, everything is changing on a daily basis. And for you to be a good planner, you need people who are well trained, who are exposed to, because you need always to borrow ideas. You know, at times you have an idea, but to translate it into, you know, a source code or maybe a, an algorithm which you can use to, you know, handle a lot of data and give you something that you can use in the end of the day requires people who are well trained, people who are committed. And I can assure you that um, the only challenge is outdated. When 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 these systems get outdated, or maybe they have been open, they are open source. They're not updated on a daily basis, and then eventually someone who was trained on that on that particular software, maybe you know, left the company. And you know, as so, I think it's it's a, it's a, a blend of uh, you know knowledgeable or maybe experienced people in terms in area of modeling. But also on the open source side to improve it on a daily basis so that it is able to capture new changes. You know, the renewable energy is coming. You know, there is a way how it's being modeled in the system, how it reflects. You know, the, the actual how it uh, performs. Uh, so if an open source was developed a long time ago and it's no longer being updated, you realize that there are some aspects you are unable to capture. Now we are talking about carbon markets. You see. So different things that you need to capture in, in one single model, which at times um, a certain software may not be having. That's why we tend to go for a customized one because we have that particular need at that particular moment and then we give all the information we need to, to be analyzed. So that, that, that's where it all, you know, that's where the difference comes from. Yeah. Um, like maybe just um, because I think what you mentioned basically is like also, um, there are new situations, you need adjustments, maybe there's a new technology coming. Um, so how can you um, 
um, increase the development speed or how you can uh, adapt quickly to new situations. Um, like Jared, like what is your point um, on, on that? Like um, comparing like, for example, the development speed of a closed model uh, to, to the development speed in an open model, are there like potentially differences? Yeah, I mean, I guess just speaking from our perspective, we do and have come from um, very much a trusted commercial model that's applied a lot in the South African energy planning space. And not by all institutions, but most definitely by uh, policymakers, national departments, the national utility. And what we found is that the tools that are used, particularly commercial and closed tools, are then specifically developed as a function of the client demand. So um, if there is a very particular piece of functionality that one client wants, um, that is then put into a queue and developed over time. It might be that it's developed very quickly. It might be that it's developed over the course of the next three years because it's in a very long queue. Um, the one thing that I've seen personally in the sort of open modeling, open data, um, I guess fraternity is the ability to then leverage off a range of institutions to contribute to particular functionality that by almost a, a social consensus that gets to a point where there's functionality needed and more and more would then work on that, more individuals, more institutions would then work on that functionality and develop it out. So it, it's, it's implicitly self-regulating in and of itself as well. So you develop functionality in an area that's more valuable because more people are doing it and it's sort of self-completing and looping around for itself. Um, for us as, as the CSR, we're really trying to move across to more open modeling and open data and we'll hopefully be able to reach some of those efforts and that some other institutions are doing similar and wants very similar functionality. But I just wanted to um, reflect on what was mentioned around the, uh, the functionality of commercial versus open tools and open models. Um, I think that it's more about trust and comfort in the tools that are being used. And uh, if you have the, uh, the time and the, and the resources to be able to test that you have a particular outcome or not a particular outcome, but you have a particular question and you have a particular set of outcomes that you're seeing in the commercial tools you're already applying. If you can benchmark that and test it against and validate it at least against open tools or open modeling frameworks, then you have comfort to then shift across to that open tool or that open modeling framework and then go from there. And that, that stepping stone uh, takes time. I think it takes, uh, like I said, the, the users need comfort and probably more importantly, the decision makers need comfort and the fact that those results are validated and can be compared to previous outcomes that they would have seen in the tools that they've that are tried and trusted um, over time. Um, that's great points. Uh, like you mentioned something about trust, like uh, just going a bit deeper on that, Jared. Um, um, like how can we trust uh, closed tools? Like if we cannot look into, you know, the source code, um, is, is there like also like a kind of conflict can we maybe trust uh, this open tools in, in future more well i think it's implicit i mean if the box is open then indeed of course you can <laughs> um and uh, when you have a black box or even a gray box or a slightly opaque box that some of the code is open but some of it's closed probably makes it even more difficult uh, you can trust certain parts and certain functionality but not necessarily the rest um uh, having said that of course you 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 do validate and benchmark uh, particular models for myself or for our team that, that we, we definitely do that at CSR. So when we do find um, inconsistencies with what we've seen in actuals versus what we're seeing in model outcomes, we definitely start to question that. And sometimes it's a matter of functionality. The functionality is not there. Sometimes it's a matter of there are bugs that uh, were there and no one else found before you found it. Um, having said this, I think this is also another advantage of, of open modeling frameworks in that those bugs can be found quite quickly and fixed by the community um, in and of itself. Whereas, as I said before, um, unfortunately, a lot of the time it gets put into a queue in terms of the new functionality you want. And then it just depends on where you are in the queue as to when that functionality may come through. Uh, whereas when you have more open um, modeling and open modeling frameworks and open data, you're contributing to that. Uh, your community is contributing to that and hopefully you get to an outcome that then is um, able to be tested by all and then trusted by all uh, implicitly. That's a great point. Um, Stefan, um, like, um, how do you see, how do you see, um, like, this uh, battle uh, between the closed and open models? Um, like, you're also developing, uh, like, your uh, own tool, right, uh, Calliope? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, some some of the points that I'm hearing, you know, I think mirror mirror also general sort of points that often come up in 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 arguments about closed source versus or commercial software versus free and open source software, where you know people say, well, I, I really need support to be available twenty four seven, so I'd rather just pay Microsoft or or some other company that uh, that I can trust to provide that. So that that's that, that's maybe a, an issue with um, uh, with business models for 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 open source developers to actually um, be able to provide that uh, that kind of support as well. But but I think uh, what I'm also hearing is this um, this skill skills to use. Um, the, the open source tools that are available right now. And, and I think that's uh, it's partly maybe a, a perception uh, question that, that open source tools are perceived to be hard to use or less feature complete. Um, but partly I think it's also something that we have to be, that we have to pay more attention to as the open source model developers to, to really focus on usability and and, and make make the tools more accessible. But I mean, Stefan, that's something um, one can achieve, like if we target it in this direction, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's how commercial models are doing that as well. That's true. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and that is, of course, uh, commercial providers uh, have have that as a that that's the business model that you you call them up and you. You immediately get someone airdropped in that can customize this, uh, provide a customized solution. Um, like maybe what I also want to mention is, um, like we, for example, if we have um, commercial tools, um, I mean, all this knowledge stays within one company. Um, maybe they have like uh, twenty developers or, or whatever on on this tool, but um, I think uh, what cannot happen is like that people outside this company can um, build up on this knowledge. And I think, uh, Jared, uh, you, you mentioned something really nice um, with this tools that we can possibly stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Um, okay, let's move maybe to, to, to uh, data. Uh, like I just, before we got our next presentation, um, Amino, um, you mentioned something about data that this is a critical uh, point um, in, in Nigeria as well. Sorry, I just have a question for the the last presenter, Stephen. Uh, that's Stephen. Yeah, Stephen. Uh, in your cost of uh, developing your model, do you consider the system of energy utilization in Africa? Because when we started with IAEA, that, uh, that is uh, atomic um, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, they gave us some, an open source model like this, which looks quite similar to yours. But uh, we, what we, the, the drawbacks there, uh, there are a lot of things, uh, there are a lot of sources or how we utilize some of the sources, which is not really in the system and capturing it had to go through a lot of, uh, modernizing the, the modeling tool again before we can be able to get grabs exactly how Africa could uh, I mean how the system of Africa will appear in the in the uh, will be captured by the model so I don't know your your own development if is that flexible well let me just cite an example uh, you know we have motor fields which is basically used for uh, moving vehicles but here in Nigeria, because of poor grid supply of electricity, we utilize uh, motor fuels to generate electricity in our own homes or shops. So when the tool, when uh, the, this IA tool we're using does not capture that. So we just have a way of improvising how this, uh, the, the, this energy resource could be utilized, could really show in the result or else it will appear in the data, but it will not show in the results because it will just disappear in the system. And as well, uh, when it comes to heating sources, uh, the tool initially did not capture uh, 
all these traditional wood fields. Uh, but eventually, they uh, we captured it as traditional uh, or biomass uh, resources. So I'm asking if the, the models you are developing are actually capturing the system of Africa. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, basically, the, um, I, I think the question was related to um, uh, like if we can add new functions. Uh, to modeling tools, um, maybe in, in short, Stefan, before we move on to the presentation, what is your response on that? Yeah, I, I, I think, I, yeah, this this is partly a question of, of the code, the functionality available in a modeling tool. And I think here also reflecting on the standing on the shoulder of giants point, we uh, the, the range of modeling tools that are available, open modeling tools, uh, I think most of them make it quite easy to add additional functionality. Um, and then part of it is the data question, really. Uh, do you have the data that you need for these for these energy sources? And I think that's what we're coming to next as well. Absolutely. Um, let's move maybe um, now um, to the next, um, next uh, presentation from uh, our team. Um, and then uh, let's discuss later uh, a bit more about this open uh, open data issue. So, uh, Kun. <laughs> yeah. All now, right. Now it's your turn. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Yes. What about now? <laughs> yes. Now they're here. Great. Um, so, I'm honored to introduce you our project. Um, we're just going to hold a short presentation to talk about what we're doing, what our, our motivation is um how we're working um and yeah then we'll have more time for discussion afterwards as well um so we are working on a project to uh build a high quality open model for the african energy system uh and uh, i'm very thankful for stefan's uh, presentation earlier because it really puts the model into a perfect context um this is the kind of uh, open energy systems model that we're uh, trying to build. So um, we uh, want to create a powerful and easy to use uh, platform. Uh, one of the key uh, novelties is uh, that we want to uh, capture a very high resolution with our model uh, and include power flow model uh, modeling and uh, transmission grid. Um, we are planning to use a very modular and reproducible methodology, um, which will make this model easy to maintain, easy to improve, extend, adapt to particular needs. Um, and of course, uh, this is all uh, open source. We are working with open data. And so we're really trying to uh, yeah, create a transparent and like Stefan said, understandable uh, model uh, that should be applicable for uh, policy research and development. Um, and we are living in exciting times because uh, a lot of data is becoming available uh, on a continental scale for Africa, which is what makes uh, this uh, project possible to a large degree. Um, a recent project uh, that we've looked at quite a bit is uh, the Global Electrification Platform, uh, which has gathered a lot of uh, data related to the transmission network, to energy demand, generators, renewable potential, um, and it's all sort of ripe for integrating into uh, a powerful energy systems model. Um, so some of the work that has been done on this before uh, is yeah, the global electrification platform, like I mentioned, uh, but it is mainly focused on the data, but it doesn't model much of the physics of uh, of the whole energy system. Uh, another exciting development that we saw uh, is TEMBA, which is, is an, uh, an energy systems model for the whole African continent, uh, but it doesn't capture the resolution uh, that we want to achieve. And in the chat, actually, another model was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, which is uh, in a <laughs> introduced in a preprint, which I just had a look at and also looks really interesting. So I would recommend having a look at that. Um, we are taking a lot of inspiration from the Pipes a Year model, uh, which is quite recent development. Uh, it is a, uh, <laughs> a high resolution 
energy systems model for the European continent. Uh, very interesting. There's a lot of uh, research being done with it. Uh, and it has a number of uh, important advantages, uh, which, well, I already touched on uh, some of this, but it has a modular, modular design. It works with uh, open source libraries, which are easy to reuse. Um, it has an adjustable resolution, uh, which is very interesting, uh, spatial resolution as well as temporal. Um, it is very much uh, built on an automated and reproducible workflow. Um, it is easy to incorporate new data. It's easy to uh, adjust to individual needs. And basically, we want to take these, uh, <laughs> these features, these advantages, uh, and bring them to uh, an energy systems model for the African continent. Um, so using this data that is becoming available. So we want to build on the, on the code base and reuse uh, <laughs> as much as possible and contribute back also. And then uh, one of the longer term goals is also that we'll be able to couple the two models, uh, which opens uh, a lot of exciting possibilities uh, and in the whole process, you can see this in the context of contributing to uh, global modeling efforts uh, as well. Um, yeah, and then for the next half of the presentation, I would like to hand it over to Rebecca. She's going to talk a little bit more about the project. Thank you, Cohen. Um, oh, yeah, I'll now speak on our project development timeline and specifically the work packages we're hoping to develop. Well, our co-development team will begin coding and data analysis and data collection for pipes in East Africa at the beginning of May. And this will focus on a set of six work packages, which include demand modeling, conventional generation modeling, uh, renewable resource energy modeling, land constraint modeling, line and substation modeling. And our final work package, which we're especially excited about, is focusing on data creation and validation using AI satellite asset recognition. And we believe this is co-benefits for open energy system modeling outside of the pipes and meets Africa. And I think echoes um, some of the concerns and points raised by our panelists about transparency and uh, the benefits of open, open source um, modeling and, and open access data. Alongside code development, we're also hoping to run a series of workshops and um, to better gauge how our model can be applied and used in policy research and industry. And again, I think this echoes themes of need for understandability, usability and transparency. If you are interested for panelists and participation participants in further engaging with the Pipes and Meets Africa project, we've identified kind of three key routes through which you or your organization could, could support the project. Um, these include helping us to promote and increase our user base through sharing the project idea and concept with your networks. Um, but we're also recognizing there's so much expertise in webinars such as these, and we would love, we would so value your contributions to helping us best develop and apply this model and welcome inputs on new developments. Uh, we'll be regularly updating our website on new developments um, to this to the project in the lo much longer term and building on the existing momentum that I think was identified by the panelists as well for open source energy system modeling for accessible, just and affordable electrification. We're hoping to be able to support it uh, yeah, at some point in the future and um, PhDs in energy system modeling um, in institutions across the major power pool regions. Uh, we also recognize that there's so much existing and new emerging research on energy system modeling and electrification, which is taking place across government institutions and research institutions in, in Africa. Uh, sorry, next slide. Um, we believe there's also contributing to the development and application of Pipes and Meets Africa, um, hosts a range of co-benefits for both developers and those utilizing or those hoping to partner. Um, and these include joining a model development, which we hope is aiming to expand electrification, decrease energy costs, and to reduce energy poverty. And also being involved in developing a system or in building on the expertise that has already been the groundwork that has been laid in open and free modeling tools for transparent policy development and decision-making. Finally, we would promote partners on open platforms and on, um, on our websites. I'd like to also briefly, I know we're, we're kind of running short on time, but introduce our team. We're very lucky to have um, a dedicated team of PhD students and consultants who are really committed to code development, to data analysis and to outreach. Um, and we're also very fortunate to benefit from the insights of panelists such as those here today. Um, 
and participants in this webinar and also advisor and advisory team of um, energy system modeling experts. Um, I'd also love this to use this opportunity, given that this is a webinar filled with people who know so much about energy system modeling and have an interest in this topic to reach out to, to those who are interested in co-developing and would like to join our team um, from around, around the globe and particularly in Africa. Thank you so much for listening and please don't hesitate to contact us on pipesandmeetsafrica at gmail.com um, to get for any further questions or to get further involved in any of the project elements in, in code development and in outreach. Um, I'll now pass back to Max for our short di discussion and concluding remarks. Yeah, um, thank you, Rebecca. Um, thank you, Kuhn, like great job. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, I mean, like what I just want to point out, um, like this project, um, we want to finish that and like a prototype until end of this year. Um, and like building up on this prototype, um, we really want um, like to add this new collaborators uh, um, to this tool, um, like um, getting some, attracting some talents. Um, that's why we want to uh, build this P PhD hubs and, and different power pools, like um, creating users um, that built, built on, on our shoulders, uh, basically, um, to, to add new features. And, and we can collaborate with the industry to, to add these new features, uh, which was demanded by industry. Um, yeah. And I, th I think like one approach would be exactly like starting with some kind of PhD positions. Um, but there's certainly also other ways. Um, if you have any ideas, <laughs> this is uh, like, we welcome any kind of ideas in that direction. Um, yeah, like, I think we like, first of all, maybe do you have any kind of suggestions uh, or feedback on that? Um, Seems like a, um, a great initiative. Like I said, it's always good to have more um, modeling tools available, particularly open modeling tools. And I think specifically for the African region, it becomes increasingly important as the sometimes the, the barrier in terms of uh, commercial tools is always there financially. Uh, as I was also mentioning, though, the, the, the sustainability of moving across from a, a tool that perhaps is closed, or even if it's open under controlled disclosure, if it's provided by particular governments, um, also has, it also has its limitations. Um, so I think open modeling tools and open modeling frameworks that are provided, um, I suppose in inverted commas, no strings attached, I think will be the most important component in an outcome uh, of the exercise. And um, as a CSR, we're obviously happy to be involved and, and, and contribute, particularly focusing on, I guess, the SADC and Southern African Power Pool region. It's where we based, uh, but always, um, very close and, and, and have the context of the African region in mind. So we would be happy to contribute if it's data, happy to contribute if it's some functionality over time that you add to it. Um, it would be interesting to see how we take this over the next um, few months and years. And um, it, it's, uh, I think it's a great initiative. Thanks. Thanks, Jared. Um, like any comments uh, from the uh, other panelists on, on uh, like this development? Uh uh, Max, I just want to ask if um, the model you're developing will also take other energy forms, not just uh, electricity. Yeah, like that's a great point. Um, so basically, um, like what we are planning with this model development is starting first with um, the electricity sector um, because we have actually good, good data on that. Um, so, but in, in future, and that's something Stefan also mentioned, it's, it's like really a, a thing of data. Um, maybe like we haven't explored too much around like other sectors at the moment, but so we can also, I mean, in, include like hydrogen. I mean, that's a functionality which we will include also in this electricity um, version of the model, but you could potentially also include like a heat sector. Um, I mean, cooling is also electricity basically, mostly um yeah and transport sector can be included like all this stuff can be included and and we are really uh, flexible with doing that like it's just a matter of execution and 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 also data okay tom okay yeah thank you so i i, I really appreciate uh, i like i like the the entire uh you know 
the process you're going through and, and um, uh, you know, what you've just uh, mentioned in terms of um, the areas of uh, concentration. I've, I've heard you'll be doing, if you'll be able to do uh, demand modeling, um, uh, renewable energy, uh, generation modeling, maybe short circuit analysis through transmission line loading, condition, all that stuff. So I think that that's where most of my, I had an issue on uh, the, the scope of this, this model. So I wanted to understand exactly uh, what can it do? Uh, and, and, and I think you've answered that through what uh, Rebecca said. Yeah. The other question would be on data. So how are you going to acquire data? Apart from AI, I understand you may not get updated information or maybe uh, I don't know how good the coverage is in terms of you getting data, yeah. but uh, that would be the most, uh, the most challenging aspect. And I would love to understand how you are yeah. gathering model, uh, which kind of like fits into the other aspects of trust. Yeah. Uh, as you know, this software, you know, the challenge is, can people trust it? Is, does it really give you the, the right results? The ease of use capability. You see how capable is the model for, for it to be able to yeah. run, simulate, you know, data once you fit in for how long and, you know, such kind of things. Uh, yeah, if you yes. can. Uh, yeah. Like I, I like I can point uh, uh, like two two things out. Uh, let's maybe start with this interface stuff. Um, yeah, like I, I think as Stefan <laughs> mentioned already, um, um, like we can actually work a bit more on on creating nice uh, interfaces uh, for, for making use easier um, for people who are maybe not di uh, data scientists. Um, but that's uh, actually also just a matter um, of execution. Like um, if, if someone um, got, for example, a project to make that um, in the best possible way, um, then it's, it's uh, it, like, you, you know, we can set up resources on that and it can happen uh, over, over a short, shorter time of period. Um, like the second point, like you mentioned data and um, what we're planning with this AI stuff. Like I can clarify that as well. Um, basically, like nowadays, um, you can actually, <laughs> you can just walk around and, and can see some assets, you know, you can see transmission lines, you can see substations. Um, then, okay, sometimes you're uh, geographical restricted. Nowadays, we also have now Google Maps, for example, using satellite pictures. And now you can actually by hand as a human go through the, through the wall. And, and zoom like uh, on different assets and see, oh, okay, that's a wind turbine, that's a solar panel. So all that stuff is possible. Um, what machine learning and AI is doing now is it, it's giving you exactly that pictures, which are really highly probable to contain some kind of energy assets. Um, and in that way, like it still needs like a, a human to, to validate the data accurately. But we can uh, do that like much, much faster in terms of generating open data. Um, and we have a proven uh, methodology on that. Like the World Bank was collaborating with DevSeed on that. They, they've written down like the whole process, how things work. Um, so it's, it's definitely uh, possible and something we want also to do just for the community, um, creating this data. Um, and like I just read actually yesterday something on, on Twitter. Um, I mean, basically, why is not why governments are not doing that? Um, that was the one question. And, and like one guy on Twitter said, yeah, it's I think related to national security. Um, like maybe it's like not the best idea to know the location of every kind of substation. <laughs> um, but um, basically, I mean the. The fact is people like I'm, I'm sure a US government or whatever government, even a private person, if he wants to map through through the country, he can find uh, the assets. Um, so, so why not making them openly available and uh, creating like kind of um, better modeling results? Um, and that was the, yeah, that's basically the idea. And I mean, we're building a prototype. Maybe sometimes in part, part of the country is not with the best data. But countries are welcome to join with better data. Um, and you can also think about uh, open, like to open them up, 
like think about is it a real uh, national security issue or is it just a uh, facade um yeah um yeah that that was it quite yeah story. thank you i think you've answered uh, my question but the, the issue of national security i uh, i don't think so because uh I mean, we need optimization and we need people to, you know, I think it's, it's that's that's long time ago. I don't think now is an issue because people can get to know where all those assets are. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so uh, basically, um, do we have any no, no. other points? Yeah, Amino, please. Yeah, uh, uh, your model, did you consider, did you consider uh, like emission factor, uh, you know, this is the key in the global discussion now, as yeah. you generate electricity, you trace the carbon footprint as well. Yeah. So did you like, consider uh, modeling the emission factors? Um, yeah, like uh, uh, emission can be uh, tracked in the models. Uh, that's not pro like not a problem. Um, yeah, then like sometimes, of course, like, uh, um, like I, I know with this LCA studies, like even um, there are some uh, more developed, like, and I think even close models can improve that. Um, there are certain uh, CO2 embedded in technologies. Um, that's maybe something you should consider in future as well, if we have like a highly renewable um, energy system. Um, if I yeah. can just add really quickly, also yeah. a lot of these, models and also our model can be used to study questions like the impact of carbon taxes for instance because it's very easy to uh, include these factors into the models all right um like i want actually to maybe the to other answer. question yeah i wanted to ask is okay. since you're calling it a model for africa are you able to factor some of the real real parameters for africa like temperature and all that stuff when you're modeling yeah, yeah. the life of, for example, transmission lines and all that stuff. Because I understand at times uh, you might even need to do like a, you know, economic model where you have to make a decision yeah. and therefore yeah. you need to factor such kind of things. Did you so, consider that? So, so basically uh, what we can do in fact is using environmental data um, to, to factor something in like this. Um, create assets with different uh, lifetimes. Uh, I mean, at some point, uh, the, um, you need to aggregate some kind of technologies and uh, technical details, but yes, it's possible. Um, yeah, so, so we're using, for example, for everyone to know, uh, we're using existing power plant data. Um, so we have the kind of location of, of the units. Um, the same for transmission network topologies. Um, we, we, we have um, in, in many countries kind of good data on where, where substations, where transmission lines, and we are aggregating uh, then accordingly to this um, yeah, assets which are there. Um, and we can actually also, like for example, what we're doing is we're, that was this land, land coverage constraint. Um, if, you, if, if one region is just actually a city, um, we can tell, okay, that that's a city, don't build like any kind of uh, wind plants there. Um, that's something which is possible. Um, How like do you get the line parameters, the actual parameters of a line or maybe a generator, you know, how do you get them? Um, the generator location and um, uh, line data, um, we, we get them from uh, our data sources, like one, like uh, from transmission lines. That was uh, something where, um, um, the World Bank was actually creating a really good data set on that. As I said, we substations, the transmission lines can be also recognized uh, with um, AI uh, and satellite uh, pictures. Um, I understand. That's, I, understand. Yeah, I, thought you, I thought you were also interested in actual parameters. For example, if you're talking about line, you need to understand the voltage level, you need to understand the loading conditions of the line, yeah. If depending upon the kind of analysis you want to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, like partly our data is classified in different um, technologies. Uh, um, Khalid, you, you said something. Yes, I, yes I, I want to ask a question, please. Uh, I hear that we, you, you said that uh, it's like dem demand modeling in, in your tools. Am I right? Yeah. 
So how, how you model the demand or is it uh, uh, to forecast the demand, demand projection or it's just uh, input data for the model? I have the energy demand like this. So is it, it will develop the energy demand or it's input data for the model? So um, like uh, we can do both, you know, we can model demand and actually that's what we are um, uh, doing. Um, because sometimes countries are um, not uh, giving maybe the data. Um, so they are like hourly data of demand. So we, are, we have to model it. Um, but yeah, countries can provide their profiles, um, their demand profiles, even like in different regions. And that improves like the model. Um, like I just want to open up now <laughs> for the last few minutes, uh, for the last three minutes, uh, some questions. Um, we just have no... I don't know if you saw Max, but Stefan also has his hand up. Oh, all right. No, I couldn't see that. Uh, Stefan? Yeah, just I mean, just briefly to 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 get back to this point that or or this this issue that um, to be careful about what what a model is and and that you're you start with a question and that determines what what your model is, right? So I think I think this is actually really great because you're you you have a range of different work packages looking at um, gathering data and making data available. Um, so I would almost I would, I would frame this more as a sort of toolkit for modeling rather than a model because you can then mix and match these different data sources depending on what question you're actually you want to look at. Right? Definitely, yeah, that's a good point. So now um, two minutes maybe for questions. <laughs> um, okay, let, let's get in some questions. Um, do we have already some questions? If not, just uh, write them. I think you can uh, reply to some of them in the chat, okay. but ju just to add to your answer, uh, Max, to Kelly and Tom, we're right now working on an academic paper to be released uh, that in detail defines the inputs and outputs of the model and where what our data sources are, where they're coming from, their resolution, etc. So once that is available, it will be a technical paper around six pages or so. It will be shared publicly and will be open access. So hopefully you can find more details there. Yeah, like I think actually we, like we have to um, keep the questions out and, and thanks uh, Desant for, for responding to them, uh, to most of them already. Um, yeah, I th like I think we just wrap it now up. Um, um, so, like I think what we saw is uh, that open modeling gives some opportunities um, like for maybe faster work, faster development, um, develop, like if, if companies need some specific developments or industry, they can uh, finance that work and uh, just hire their own personal, just work on that, uh, contributing on that open source code, creating these features. Um, I think another point, um, what we mentioned is, um, yeah, data is some kind of issue. Um, creating good data um, is actually um, a need, and we hope to contribute to this. Um, and hope also, if we're creating some kind of nice open framework for the continent, that um, countries want to contribute themselves with better data. Um, yeah, another point was also. Um, yeah, like we mentioned actually that the, beside the development speed, that there's also kind of um, development quality that might be improved because people can um, transparently see what's the code, um, get rid of the mistakes. Um, then Jared, I think you mentioned something really nice about um, su sustainable uh, in, in investments. Um, so, like if you finance something in, in an um, open source project um, create these features, it will stay there. You don't have to pay like regularly for, for this specific uh, features of this tool. Um, so maybe that might be also um, to take away. Um, and then also, I think big point is also just creating this talents, the skilled, skilled people for the future. Um, and yeah, like maybe moving on beyond uh, this uh, just interface handling, maybe also knowing what's behind, being able to look behind the curtain, 
Um, I think that's something we can um, give the opportunity with open source models. We can also make the use and the transparency directly from the beginning uh, possible. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward um, to our and maybe at the end of this year final presentation and how everything went and also to present you um, that model. Um, thanks again to all the panelists. Like it, it was a pleasure to have you here. Um, and, and thanks for your feedback. Thanks for your questions. Um, thank you to all and have a great day. Thank you, Max. Nice to meet you all people. Thank you. Lovely to meet you all too. Okay, bye-bye. All right. Thanks to everyone.